Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display His craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make Him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4, New Living Translation. Hello, I'm Victoria Kay. Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. I'm here today with R.D. Fierro, founder of Crystal Sea Books and part time poet. Today on Anchored by Truth, as we approach Thanksgiving and Christmas, we are going to begin a new series where we focus on the central figure of the entire Bible, Jesus. That seems appropriate as we come to the time of year when we celebrate the Lord's birth, doesn't it, R.D.? Well, Christmas is certainly the time of the year when people begin to more naturally think about Jesus because the reminders of Jesus, the reminders of Christmas, well, they just start to appear everywhere. They're around us more and more every day. But of course, it's important for us to remember that we as Christians should really focus on Jesus every single day of the year. For Christians, Jesus should be the focus of our daily lives. And actually, throughout our lives, We should always be on a quest, if you will, to get to know God better each and every day that He grants to us. I agree with that. So today, we're going to start listening to a new Crystal Sea Books story. This time, it's one of our rhymed pieces that you wrote as a Christmas epic poem. You said you originally wrote the first installment because you wanted to give it as a gift to some co-workers. I did. Years ago, when I was a state employee and I worked in one of those big state agency buildings that are so common here, I wanted to give some Christmas presents to some of my coworkers. But you know, doing that in a state agency can be a little tricky. So I decided that the one present that I could give my coworkers was a little entertainment. So I wrote a piece that was inspired by some of the kinds of stories that used to entertain the kids of my generation. You know, it was common when I was a kid for there to be Christmas poems that people would read or recite as they sat around during the Christmas celebration. And it was also common when I was a kid to go to the movies and before the main movie, there was always this serial short feature that they would play. And each one of those serial short features would always have a story that was told in multiple parts. But the trick was every part except for the very final one, the hero or heroine or story always left you hanging right on the edge of something. Now, I won't bother to go into any of the plots that were common in those days, but the point was that each one of those serial short parts always ended on what we've come to know as cliffhangers. So I decided to write a Christmas story for my coworkers, and I wrote it in parts, and each part left the listener or the reader wondering what would come next. And then a few years ago, you decided that the story needed to continue, so you wrote the next installment of what is going to be, when completed, a poetic trilogy. The story began in Crystal Sea Book's Christmas epic poem, The Golden Tree, Kamari's Quest. The story continued in The Golden Tree, Eagle Enigma. And today we are beginning the final part of the trilogy. Here is part one of The Golden Tree... The Frost Lion The Golden Tree The Frost Lion In the great far north, when winter descends, the sky turns indigo blue. The northern lights frolic and play and dance a long night through on snowy blankets that cover
cover each hill the sheen of lights glimmer bright. A rainbow quilt spreads gently across a land enjoying rest and quiet. And though the air is midwinter brisk, Christmas brings warmth and cheer. The holidays discard much of the chill for those who hold loved ones dear. And so it was in a happy koala town that lay around a golden tree. The bears embraced this season of joy that brought mirth, delight, and glee. The koalas had lived near the golden tree for more seasons than any could remember. But all the bears knew of that day long ago when the demon lord came in December. The demon lord had come to steal the tree for it brought beauty to a land so dark. And the demon lord hated joy and peace. Despair, fear, and gloom were his marks. But the koalas had stood their ground that day for small size didn't make them less bold. Their brave stand brought help in the night, and the demon was banished to the cold. And though many years had passed since then, the bears all knew of that fight. So though they reveled in holiday joy, the bears stayed vigilant in the night. And all the bears remembered the stories of the demon's unmistakable shape, a looming, horrid, hooded figure surrounded by a blood-red cape. Ever since then, bears wore coat and cap. None wore flowing cape, for they had no desire to think upon any reminder of demonic drape. But in the winter, the bears adored the sky, especially the bears not quite grown. And often before they closed their day, they journeyed to a hill near their home where the lights soared in that vault overhead and proclaimed indescribable glory as if the heavens could not but proclaim their omnipotent creator's story. Mother, the bread now cools on the stove and the sky tonight is so green. Might I venture to the hills to the south where better the lights may be seen? Coest bright-eyed, the oldest of five, had finished her daily tasks, and her mother, Co Ray, heard need in her voice and thought how rarely she had asked. Go, my child, you have done well today, but soon the family must dine, and then we must help the younger bears, beds, quilts, and sleep to find. And I see in the street your very best friend, Kupal, seems headed there too. Go with him, for he is good and kind, and good company to see a climb through. In scarcely moments, the pair was bound toward the crest of the highest hill. They worked to mount its steepening slopes, but at the top they instantly fell still. There in the distance, where no one should be, they beheld a dark, lumbering shape, and they instantly recalled what all bears feared, the descriptions of the demon lord's cape. They watched the shape move unsteady and slow. After weak, wavering steps, it fell. What should we do? Co asked, worried aloud. Should we rush to the village and tell? They stared at the shape, now lying quite still, in their minds, dire thoughts flew. Has the demon lord come, our tree to steal, and threaten our village anew? I really like some of the lines from that part. Quote, Where the light soared in the vault overhead and proclaimed indescribable glory, as if the heavens could not but proclaim their omnipotent creator's story, unquote. Not only are the lines lyrical, but they also evoke such clear imagery. I can imagine kids sitting around with their mom and dad. Or grandmother and grandfather. Or grandparents. And listening to this recording with them. 
just like families used to sit around and listen to someone read The Night Before Christmas. Of course, that's one of the reasons we wanted to put this poem out there, to give families an entertaining story that would also allow parents to discuss their faith with their kids. Exactly. You know, there are so many questionable choices these days that are actually advertised as being, quote, family-friendly, but those family-friendly productions, projects, whatever they are, are based on a very secularist view of the world. So I wanted to be sure that there was a story out there that was available for Christian audiences for that fireside listening that we used to think about, people gathered around the fire listening to someone tell a story. I wanted to make sure that there was one of those fireside listening stories that directed everyone's attention to the real reason for the season. Well, there are a total of seven parts to Golden Tree, the Frost Lion. So for the next six weeks, we'll be letting the story unfold as we continue to unpack insights into how the Bible is such an integral part of being able to frame a coherent worldview. I mean, the two fundamental attributes that you believe would have to characterize any book that would constitute a genuine, special revelation of God are that the revelation would have to be consistent with the created order, as it is observable by creatures within it, essentially us, and that the revelation would have to display supernatural origin. Right. Now, as hard or as exciting as it may be to comprehend, The empirical observations of the universe, combined with just the application of logic, tell us that the visible universe cannot, does not, provide an explanation for its own existence. The universe, as grand and as vast as it is, has all of the fingerprints of having a beginning in space and time. And also, the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, tells us that the universe will have an ending someday. Well, anything that has a limited lifespan, no matter how long that lifespan might be, cannot be self-existent. And yet only a self-existent being or entity can account for its own existence or for the existence of anything else. And some philosophers use the terms necessary being and contingent being to describe the difference between these two forms of beings. And since the universe is not eternal, it looks very much like it is contingent on something or someone outside itself to account for its existence, a necessary being upon which it is dependent. And we call that necessary being God. So just like the bears in our story, when we see the northern lights or stars twinkling in a deep night sky, we can know that that starlight, that that night sky, and especially our ability to see and understand all that grandeur points to the need for a creator. And we've seen that the bears we've just met aren't the first bears who have lived in this land. It was actually their ancestors who left their home and shortly will learn they were searching for the lair and throne of their creator, who they thought of as the great white bear. Yes. I mean, I think the symbolism that people are going to hear in the story, it's pretty plain. But I would like to point out one thing that we're already coming to in the story, and something I want to spend a little more time on today. The bears who originally set out on the quest and wound up in that great northern land would not have set out on a quest at all if they were not convinced that the great white bear existed. And you know, that's one of the problems that we see reflected so clearly in today's relativistic culture. Too many, far, far, far too many people, both inside and outside the church, they're defeated in their own quests for meaning in their lives because they have been misled to believe that there is no creator, no great white bear, if you want to call it that. As a result, those people, the ones who don't believe in a creator, who can't see in their own hearts and minds the necessity for a creator, well, those people see the world as either being fundamentally chaotic at the best or outright meaningless at worst. I think you need to expand on that thought a little bit. You're saying that God isn't just a logical necessity to explain the existence of a contingent universe, 
but that an awareness of God is an essential component of us being able to comprehend our place in that universe. Well, to quote what I sometimes say in our humorous life lessons, exactamundo. So, you're quoting yourself. Sounds like something only a writer would do. Again, exactamundo. Anyway, as the eminent theologian R.C. Sproul used to say, ideas have consequences. And the idea that the universe was framed by an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and holy God, well, that idea carries with it the inextricable notion that the universe has been created intentionally and for a specific purpose. And because there was an orderly, intelligent God behind the universe, well, that kind of a universe would display the design and order of its creator. And it would also carry with it the implication that intelligent creatures, intelligent beings within that universe, namely us, well, the idea that we were created by an intelligent, purposeful God, that would allow us to perceive the design and order and purpose that is present in the universe. And that very concept formed the foundation for what we think of as science today. And that's why many of the founders of modern science like Sir Isaac Newton and Louis Pasteur, were strong Christians. They were convinced that there was design, order, and logic in the universe because the universe had been made by a being that was supremely purposeful and logical. As such, they were encouraged to go and discover that order and use the results of it to improve the lives of the people around them. Or, said a little differently, They were encouraged to go on their own quests to discover more about the creation and thereby appreciate even more the Creator. Right. So all that made perfect sense. If the universe had been created by a God of order, logic, and purpose, then the creation would be comprehensible. And those early giants of science took very seriously the biblical statement that man had been made in the image of God. So those early scientists, guided by that fundamental foundational belief in God as the Creator, felt sure that God would bless their efforts at applying themselves to understanding the creation that He had created. But one of the truly sad effects of the success of those early scientists' work and the amazing results that they have achieved over time, and now we're talking about centuries, not decades, Well, the work of science became divorced from the original source of inspiration for the scientists to do their work. And unfortunately today, we see that too many scientists, not all by any means, but a great many, have become convinced that it is possible to understand the creation while ignoring the creator. Or said slightly differently, they sought the blessing without regard to the blesser. So, one of your points you're making is that somewhere along the journey, the quest for discovery, a lot of people forgot why the journey was begun in the first place, and that is reflected in our society and culture today. Yes, and Christmas is a great example of that same phenomenon happening to our calendar and to our celebration of the common understanding that was once the foundation of our communities. The word Christmas obviously derives from the words Christ and Mass. And one of the big reasons that gift exchanges became a part of the celebration of Christmas was in commemoration of the great gift that God had given the entire world in the birth of Jesus. And of course, the whole reason that God gave us the gift of Jesus was because after the fall in the Garden of Eden, God had begun His very great plan of redemption. So, In a very real way, the history of all mankind gives evidence of God's plan unfolding in exactly the way God had intended. And you believe that even some of the more tragic of the things that we see around us provide evidence for the existence of God and the truth of Scripture. Yes. C.S. Lewis, that phenomenal writer of the 20th century, noted that one of the things that convinced him to become a Christian was that he could not get over the idea that some things were right and some things were wrong. But then Lewis realized, for that idea to make sense, well, there had to be a real distinction, a real difference between right and wrong. Because if there's no real distinction or difference between right and wrong, why bother trying to differentiate between them? 
Then Lewis came up with the thought he had to have an explanation for where that idea came from. Why did Lewis think that there was a real distinction between right and wrong? Well, of course, the only logical conclusion was, and is, that there is a being, a God somewhere, who had established the moral and ethical framework to begin with. And that being, that God who established the moral and ethical scheme, designated a real difference, a real distinction between right and wrong. Well, that idea is just as true today as it has ever been. That's a pretty remarkable idea when you think about it. The very notion that we have ethical sensibilities to begin with is dependent on there being a real difference between right and wrong and not just a matter of personal convenience like preferring squash to broccoli. When people begin to assert that something is wrong, they just don't mean that they find it inconvenient. They mean that there is a determinable ethical distinction that compels, or should compel, our behavior. And we all know that. Anyone who doesn't know that there is a difference between right and wrong, we would describe as a sociopath. And we would have good reason for doing so. Now, when I say this, we're not saying that there is a universal agreement among all cultures on the precise details of what is right or wrong. And different societies at different times have arrived at varying conclusions about the specifics of what's right and what's wrong. But there has never been a society in Earth's history that did not make some kind of a distinction between right and wrong regardless of how they settled on the specifics. Now, in some cultures, the distinctions between right and wrong might have been ones that we would consider to be trivial. The rules have varied, but every culture, tribe, and nation has had some kind of rules of some sort that said in that culture, within their cultural framework, what was right and what was wrong. And pretty much all the people everywhere know that they have, at one point or another, violated those rules written or unwritten, governmental or cultural, religious or secular. We have an inherent awareness that as moral and ethical agents, we have certain obligations that we are subject to. So we see that not only is there a physical order to the physical universe, there is also an ethical order that applies to us as people. But without there being a God, a holy and purposeful God, we would have no reasonable explanation for the existence either of the obligation or the sense that we need to be accountable to that obligation. And that same sense that tells us that we are subject to the obligation tells us that we have all fallen short. Right. We all know that we are not perfect. But to be able to make the statement that we know we are not perfect means that we know that somewhere there is a standard against which that determination can be made meaningfully. And that's why Jesus had to come and why the Christian claim that Jesus was not just a man, but perfect, was sinless, is so essential. Again, to go back to R.C. Sproul, Sproul used to say that if he was in a discussion with someone who just absolutely refused to acknowledge the existence of God, Sproul would ask them what that person did with their guilt. We all have guilt, and some of us feel it more keenly than others. If we don't have Jesus, if we don't know Jesus, then we're the only ones who can shoulder that guilt. But the moment we understand that the perfect man, Jesus, has willingly taken our guilt onto his own shoulders, we can start to become free of that guilt. And that's one of the keys to beginning and completing our own quests through life. As we talked about a long time ago on Anchored by Truth, understanding the Bible provides context and meaning to our lives. Knowing that God himself made a provision for our imperfection removes the need for us to continue to feel guilty forever. Knowing that Jesus is our Savior is the truth that sets us free. And that's one of the things that we really want to focus on as the days unwind toward Christmas. We want to take a close look at how we can be sure that Jesus isn't just a mythological figure, but instead is a real person who was born, who walked and played as a boy, who lived at a specific place and time, and then one day died. But then Jesus demonstrated that he was God's atoning gift by walking out of a grave 
and then Jesus appeared to a group of women first, and then to other men and women. Well, if Jesus wasn't a real person who did those things, we would have absolutely no hope for being justified before a perfectly holy God. So as we go about conducting our own quests through life, if we are pursuing worthwhile ends, we can be confident that those worthwhile ends aren't futile. There is a meaning to our individual lives, even when those lives are set against the backdrop of an unimaginably grand cosmos. The Bible and Jesus give us that meaning. As Augustine famously said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Sounds like it's a great time to have a prayer. Since we're approaching Thanksgiving, how about if today we listen to a prayer for the special day when we turn our attention to the goodness that God has shown to us? A Prayer Celebrating Thanksgiving Blessed and Wonderful Father, You are the one true God, the Lord and Master of all. We praise and glorify Your name, for You are mighty in deed and in name. You are the foundation of our faith, our sure hope, and the source of all our blessings. Lord, we want to thank You for those blessings, so many of which are manifest on this day. History tells us that our forefathers established thanksgiving as a way to acknowledge your provision in their lives. We want to continue in their footsteps to acknowledge that all good gifts come only from you and that we are completely dependent upon you for all our needs. We pray that you will be merciful to us in the future, even as you have been in the past. We praise you that you have continually provided for us even in those times when we were hard-pressed and struggling. We are amazed and blessed by your generosity and kindness. Father, among our greatest blessings are those of family and friends. Help us always to cherish them and to not take them for granted. We know that there are many this day who are without their families and far away from their friends. We pray that you would be a powerful and immediate presence to them. We pray that you would be the great comforter to them, closer than a brother, and more real than the air they breathe. Bring to our minds any who have need of the comfort that we can provide. Inspire us to reach out to them in the way that will bring them the most comfort. We especially remember our soldiers whose duties have separated them from their loved ones, and we remember their loved ones. We pray that you would be the tie that binds them together no matter what distance is between them. We pray that you would guide us to be the heart and hands of Jesus, to minister to them, ever calling to our minds that there are always times when we will need others to be Jesus to us. Thank you for the food we share and enjoy this day. It is the visible and tangible reminder you know our needs and provide them. As we break bread in fellowship and thanksgiving, We are reminded that the heavenly bread with which you met our deepest need was the body of your precious Son. We praise you especially for the atonement that he made for our sins, and it is in his holy and blessed name that we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. We'd like to remind our audience that a lot of our radio episodes are linked together in series of topics, so if they've missed any episodes, or if they just want to hear one again, all of these episodes are available on your favorite podcast app. We'd also like to remind listeners that copies of The Golden Tree, Komari's Quest, and The Golden Tree, Eagle Enigma, are available from our website. We hope you'll be with us next time, and we hope you'll take some time to encourage some friends to tune in also or listen to the podcast version of this show. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalcbooks.com, where... We're not perfect, but our boss is.